always love doing that. Hello and good evening, everybody. Always glad that you can join us. Arnie and I continue to welcome amazing guests, uh, amazing guests for this Maccabi USA Sports Show. I'm so glad we're still doing this, Arnie. We're three weeks in. We remain inspired by our mission of building Jewish pride through sports. I did want to share with all of you that uh, earlier, I guess at the end of last week, I had the privilege to participate in a Future of Sports show hosted by the former Council General to um, Israel, Ambassador Ido Aharoni. He's currently the global ambassador for the Maccabi World Union, and it was a great conversation. And then, as now, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the upheaval in our world, the focus on racism, police brutality, and how this generation in particular, our millennials and Gen Zers, and maybe all of us as well, hopefully, are leading the way to what we hope, actually, we must insist will be a changed sensibility around equality and equity. Sports has really found its way to being a central gathering place for ideas, for building social responsibility, equity, and trust. And honestly, that's what we do at Maccabi USA, right? We're building Jewish pride, right? We, we believe in our values of all people are equal. And I have to just, I wanted to share with all of you, if you did not receive our CEO, Marshall Einhorn's statement on Friday, right before we welcomed in Shabbat. And it's from the Shabbat liturgy. May citizens of all races and creeds forge a common bond in true harmony to banish hatred and bigotry, and to safeguard the ideals and free institutions that are the pride and glory of this country. I don't know. I think it's a time we come together, both in support of sports, but also what sports does to bring us together. And in this country, for the first time in many, 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 many weeks, we have sports news, real sports news. So Arnie, the NBA has announced a date and a place for the resumption of the season. Um, I know you are a Pelicans fan. Are they in or are they out? Well, Donna, the Pels are in. They're in that 22-team number that uh, was announced by the commissioner. And uh, there's a lot of excitement in my city because they went from a team that was probably not going to make the playoffs to a team that uh, has a shot now. they got to get to that, uh, you know, eight or nine seed but they, they have a shot. So it's a lot of excitement. And uh, Donna, before we, uh, just before we go any further, I, I just want to echo your, your great statement and uh, statement that Marshall put out. You know, I, I have to tell you, we're living through some unprecedented times in our country. And I, I for one, am, am really optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic that we're seeing the foundation for change in our society, in our country, uh, globally as well. And in many ways, you know, I, I don't want to date myself. It, it reminds me when I was kind of a, a teenager and there was a, you know, we were late in the late 60s and there was almost a generational handoff to a younger demographic that uh, I think the, the wor views the world uh, in a different way, a better way, with a lot less bias and, and predisposition. So I'm really encouraged. I, I have to say in New Orleans, you know, we're, we, June 1 is hurricane season in New Orleans. so. We, we had a hurt. We had a, two hurricanes here in the last That's week. Unbelievable. Uh, That's unbelievable. One, one fortunately ended up being a tropical depression and it, it wasn't so big, so much of a deal. But um, the Drew Brees statement last week. That uh, was a hurricane. That was a hurricane. That was a hurricane. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, uh, it made national news, obviously. But in New Orleans, um, you know, this is the hero of our community. And, uh, you know, he issued several statements after that that I think clarified uh, his position. But it, it was it was quite a few days in, in our city relative to that. So, again, we're, we're living through some important times, and uh, sports plays a big role in, in all of that. And we're going to talk about that tonight as well. I think so. I think we will. So, I don't know how many of you are in hurricane cities. Bruce, you're, you're, in, a, you're in a hurricane kind of alley. I'm in Florida. We bought a generator this year for the first time in 25. I hope that means it will stay away. So now it's time to introduce our guest. I love Coach Pearl. In five years, and by the way, I can stay, I can read all this stuff all night, but we'll just, I'm gonna just give like three highlights, okay? All right. In five years as head coach at Auburn, Bruce Pearl has led the Tigers to 100 wins, two Southeastern Conference championships, back-to-back -back NCAA tournament bursts, and the program's first ever appearance in the Final Four, which is heady beyond. Pearl is just one of three head coaches to take four programs, let me say that again, four programs with three at the D1 level to the Sweet 16, joining Lon Kruger and Eddie Sutton. 
And during Auburn's historic March Madness run in the 2018-19 season, the Tigers became the first team ever, I remember this, it was exhilarating, to knock off three of the winningest programs in college basketball history in succession. I am sure you remember. Kansas, North Carolina, and Kentucky. Amazing. Now, now there's tons more of this, but I have to just say we got an unsolicited little bio piece today right before the show that thank Bruce Pearl for making this woman centered a note for making her son, who is a sophomore at Auburn's life, because he takes the Auburn Hillel and many of the Jewish students over to his house and feeds them and celebrates Jewish holidays. And I have to say, I, I guess that's not on this particular bio, but honestly, that's really special, Bruce. You are a man of great emotion, many faces. Dan Kurtz, are you ready? And before we bring you on, we wanted to share this little video that showcases our friend, Coach Bruce Pearl. <laughs> Just his face, he's a very um, energetic and, and, and emotional guy. You got some legendary screams. He'd be screaming now. <laughs> um, his most recent one was... Um, he, he was mad at uh, one of the players on the court and he just did his face like guy he's playing with is Bruce Pearl disagrees. <laughs> he just did his like 15, 20 seconds. He just wouldn't stop. It was just so funny. He definitely shows us emotion and we, we know that he, he, he's very active. I, mean, I don't want to say I'm entertained. You know, but, you know, he definitely motivated me. I feel like, you know, his passion for the game really, you know, give us that extra boost that we need. You know, he wants it just as bad as his players. Um, and that's a lot because we want it so bad, especially us seniors. He's very passionate just but just going along with that. He, he wants the, the best out of us. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to be in the best position. So he definitely cares about us. Well, just having that coach and, you know, sweating on the, on the sidelines as much as you're sweating. You know, he really showed that he really cared about the game. You know, he just want to win. He's somebody who really want to win. All right, that's uh, that's a great video, Coach. Before we start, I'm going to ask you the first question. But but we have a you have a special fan north of the border who emailed us about an hour ago from Toronto, Canada, and and their son Ruben Wasserman is the biggest Auburn fan in all of Canada. So he asked the, the Hannah, the mother asked if you could give a big shout out to Ruben and the family, and they would be. Greatly appreciative. All right, where you go, Ruben? <laughs> All those pictures of my face, none of them were like this, where I'm smiling and happy. They all look like I'm in some kind of excruciating pain or really, uh, really pretty angry. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm really a nice guy. <laughs> that, that's, that's the summertime off period, Coach. That's what gives you that great smile all throughout the summer. Until yeah. basketball starts and competition right up. But I want to ask you the first question, probably the most uh, uh, important question of the evening. You, you've had a lot of big moments in your life, right? But I want to know what was most impactful. Wearing the, wearing the, the orange of Tennessee on your body some years ago or being the mascot for Boston College. I, wish, I want to know which one really made the most impact in your life. Yeah, boy, Ernie, that might be the worst question I get all night long. Thank you for tipping off like that, man. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, I don't take myself too seriously. Um, yeah, there I am. Uh, Pat Summit was playing Duke that night, and I decided to just do what the Dukies do, and that's, you know, kind of take their shirts off and paint their chest orange, but that wasn't a very good look for a 45-year-old man. That was kind of like the Incredible Bulk, not the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Prior to when they painted me up, I was doing push-ups and sit. I was doing push-ups and I was doing dumbbell curls just so I could look like I had a little bit of little bit of definition. You know, the only thing that only only thing that was Ving on my body was the letter V. The rest of it was more of a kind of a U, right? <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I and I and I know that you uh, you were a student man. You started basketball really as a kind of at Boston College. You were a student manager, right? Under a legendary coach, yep. uh, coach, coach Davis. Yep. And uh, did that lead you into the into the coaching uh, business? I mean, was that where the interest was uh, was what? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, look, the ball stops bouncing for all of us. And, you know, when I, when I was in high school, uh, I was uh, the best athlete in my class, or certainly one of them. And then uh, I had a career-ending knee injury. And, uh, you know, I was a quarterback. I was the point guard. I batted third or fourth. And, and um, uh, I used to dominate people because of my athletic ability. I think, honestly, God said, uh-huh, there's, there's more to you than that. And uh, cut me down to size a little bit. And, uh, and then when I, when I left high school after just a, you know, I, I was an, uh, a pretty good baseball player, but I, I, I was limited in what I could do athletically. I tried out for the basketball team at Boston College, and I made it for about a week. And then I got cut. And, uh, but the head coach, just Tom Davis, said, you know, he saw something in me. Maybe he saw some of that passion that my players talked about a little bit of my love for the game. And, uh, you know, gave me an opportunity to, to be on the staff, whether it be as a manager or a director of student promotion or to help run his camp. And all I did in my time there, like anybody would do in an organization, is I just try to help. And as a result of helping, I made myself really valuable in the sense that when they ask, well, who does this? Well, Bruce did it. Oh, well, who did that? I did. I mean, all the way from hosting Patrick Ewing on his official visit to putting on the Eagle costume when the Eagle was sick one weekend uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and the NCAA tournament. It just didn't matter. Um, and then when Tom Davis, the head coach, was leaving to take another job and go to Stanford, uh, I had worked for him for four years, but never dreamt that I was going to be a coach. I, I was preparing to do something else and get my degree in economics and marketing. But because I had made myself valuable and because he enjoyed the time we had, had together and saw something in me and the ability to work with young people and motivate, he said, why don't you come with me? And so my senior year before I even graduated from BC, I left uh, Boston and flew out to Stanford, California, where I, where I started my coaching career. That's a great story. Donna? You started in Stanford? Let me ask you a question. What does a Jewish boy do? Go, uh, why, why is he going to Boston College? It's like Sherry Levin, who's a Hall of Famer at Holy Cross. Like, yep. what's the story here? Yep, I, I, I absolutely. And I, Donna, I appreciate the question. Um, as an athlete, I was always trying to break down stereotypes. Uh, girls would, uh, if, they, if they found me somewhat attractive, uh, yeah. they would, uh, they would think I was Italian, right? Yes. And, you know, you got to stand. I was born in 1960, you know, so, you know, I was civil rights movement. There was a lot more anti-Semitism 15 years after Holocaust. Um, you know, it was, it was still, it was still, you know, not everybody wore their Judaism on their sleeve. Right. Um, and, um, and it really bothered me. It just, but i tell you what, it made me a better coach. Here's why. I didn't understand it. Because in sports, I didn't care what color you were. I didn't care. I, could you guard somebody? Could you get a rebound? If, if we go shirts, I'm going to pick the best shirts, and we're going to try to beat the crap out of them skins. And that's all that mattered to me. I didn't see religion or, or whether he's a rich kid or a poor kid. Could he play? Was he fun to play with? Could we compete? And so sports can teach us, obviously, you know, so much about that. But then there was, then there was forced busing. Then there was the... You know, then there was a lot of racial violence. And then in 1967, there was a six-day war. And there was a lot. And I just couldn't wrap my arms around the fact that why can we not get along? I, I don't understand. I don't understand it. So I made my, my mind, you know what? I'm going to Boston College where there's all Catholic kids. And I'm going to show them that Jewish kids can be tough. We can be fun. We're, you know, we, 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 we all worship the same Father God. And, um, you know, and, and so that's what I've been doing my whole life is trying to break those stereotypes down, trying to bring teams together, bring people of different color and different religions together. Uh, if, if, if Israel's going to thrive and survive, it can't be just because the Jewish population around the world loves Israel. The Christians need to love Israel almost as much for, for maybe for different reasons and so those are the things that I'm kind, you know, really trying to, to work towards. Um, okay. And we want to talk about that some more, but I wanted to stay a little bit rooted in basketball right now, if that's okay. I, yeah. see, I see Leah Mattiso. She played for one of our Maccabi teams. I think she played for Sherry, actually. Um, I'm just curious. To, in today's – well, there's so many questions. 
NCAA basketball. Let me let's start right here. Is Auburn going back? Um, you, we're going to we're going to. I mean, are we going to play basketball this year? Are we going to? Is that what you're asking? Are we are we going to have season? Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're going to have a season. Yes, we are. Um, the football program is back on campus. Uh, they're beginning to start to do some workouts and train. It's vital. My, my, my team comes in Friday. It's wow. vital that when we come back, we come back safely. So everybody was tested. Uh, we were all tested for the antibody as well. Um, anybody that was found to have the virus would either be quarantined or given the option to go home come back a few weeks later because most of them are asymptomatic and, and, and come back into the population. Again, we're going to be, we're going to be constantly doing testing and constantly doing monitoring and try, trying to keep our guys sort of hunkered down a little bit, but we must come back safely because if we don't and the virus is here and it spreads on campus, well, then school can't open up in the fall. And so we're going to be, we're going to do a really good job of getting prepared for our seasons. Um, but following all the guidelines, look, if they're, they're going to start playing in the NBA in Orlando in, in July, uh, we should be able to, to start playing. Um, you know, I, I, I think obviously being outdoors in a, in a fall football stadium um, is going to be one thing. It's going to be interesting to see come later in the fall, early winter, when the indoor sports start to gather, uh, whether the virus picks up any steam because of the colder weather, whether they're... You know, what's going to happen with our indoor sports? But right now, you know, we're planning on uh, coming back and playing basketball and playing football. Great. Hey, Arnie, for you. But before we go, listen, I just want to let everyone know, if you got some questions, please put them in the chat. We'll pick them out. Bruce is uh, eager to hear from all of you, as, as are Arnie and I. So please don't be shy. Arnie. Hey, Bruce, we're going um, to we're gonna cover all kinds of basketball tonight, from Milwaukee to Southern Indiana to the Final Four. So we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But, you know, I, I want to follow on kind of your story with your, your own family and your background. Obviously, I think I, think I saw on social media this week um, that you were at Tumor's Corner and, and, and supporting uh, with others what, what's happening at Auburn and around the country. Um, just talk about it from a, a, a collegiate coach standpoint. I mean, you, you know, you, you've got players that are watching you and following you. Um, Tell, tell us a little bit how you've navigated the last couple of weeks and dealt with it and, and uh, obviously talk about what happened on the Auburn campus. Well, Arnie, you know, we, again, we've dealt with it our whole lives uh, because even though it's not racism, you know, anti-Semitism or certain profiling, uh, we understand what discrimination looks like. Uh, it's a little different because um, um, my guys get profiled. Uh, we've got some real challenges uh, in our country, we've made a lot of progress, uh, but we got to focus on some of the, obviously, some of the solutions. Education, John Cheney, you know, was the one that said it more than anybody else. Education is the way that we have the best chance for equality um, and, uh, and have people be able to get caught up a little bit. Um, you know, I'm big on trying to teach my guys to be, to prepare them to be successful, to be accountable. It, 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 it's up to them at some point to be able to, you know, run with it but we've got to be able to give them an opportunity. But the differences in education around this country, because so much is based on property taxes uh, in the wealthier neighborhoods, got great schools, got great teachers. They got a big head start in rural America, poor white, poor black, inner city, poor black. They're just so far behind and we can't throw money at it, but we've got to make the educational system much more fair and, 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 and much more of an equal opportunity. And that would be one thing. The second thing is, is the criminal justice situation. I don't, I'm, you know, again, I apologize politically, uh, but I don't, think that, I don't think we should cut the, what we're paying police. I think we should pay them more. We should train them better and hold them accountable. If we're going to give them a gun and the authority to be able to take a life or protect us or whatever, they're in a very dangerous profession. And, uh, you know, we should be paying our teachers and our law enforcement more than, they, than they're making right now. But hold both accountable. And, uh, because it, there is an injustice when it does come to law enforcement. There, there is. Uh, the whole uh, war on drugs put uh, lots of African-American men in jail for 10 to 20 for fairly minor offenses. And, and in today's drug abuse, it's now opioids. And rather than putting them in jail, 
We're trying to get them help and put them in, a, in clinics and fix that problem. And so there are some things where we, we are behind. I'm, and so what do I do, Arnie? I, I live it. I confront it. I talk about it openly with my players. I, I listen to what they're having to say. And we're going to try to work to, to make those changes, providing coaches, uh, black coaches, opportunities to be on my staff. Um, I even provide Jewish coaches with the opportunity to be on my staff. Because guess what? That's not real popular either now. Okay? I helped start the Jewish Coaches Association back 10 years ago for college coaches because we, didn't, we had no voice. And we had very, very little representation. So when I first got the job at Auburn, it was myself, Stephen Pearl, Harris Adler, Todd Golden. My athletic director was David Benedict. We were two away from a minion at Auburn. They'd never had a minion at Auburn. You know? And, and, and so you, you, you lead, you know, obviously, you know, lead by example. Um, you can support the blue and believe that back black lives matter. You can honor our flag and still know that black lives matter. We, I believe, can still do both. Yeah, it's interesting here, um, Coach, that Brendan Slavka, I don't know Brendan, but he – you want to know what your thoughts are on the lack of public statements coming from college coaches. I, I did see a coach, uh, coach K yesterday made a statement. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why coaches should or shouldn't, but it's a good question from Brendan. It's a great question, but let's talk. What's a statement? My life is a statement. My actions are, are, are a statement. Um, My you know, dog is making a statement. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the sense that, um, you know, um, and I, you know, I, I had tweeted out, um, when the young man in Georgia, uh, got, got, uh, got killed, maybe got murdered, uh, and he very well may have been profiled. And, uh, when he was out for a jog and, uh, I have, I have been ahead of the, you know, just not one ahead. I'm not afraid to put it out there, but I just think sometimes what, what do you want us to say necessarily? Um, you know, I'll take the Drew Brees thing on. The timing was really difficult. The timing was really difficult. But turn the clocks back three years ago. And, you know, it was, it was a little different as far as the timing for wanting to stand up and honor, and honor the flag. And I think you can do both. Um, you know, so I, he, I don't think he was trying to get himself in any – but obviously – it was bad, and it was it was because because right now, this is right now a black man was murdered in Minneapolis in front of the entire world, and it was wrong. They murdered six million fifty sixty something years ago. It was wrong, you know. We gotta we gotta keep telling the story. So when it comes to education, we're working in Alabama to make sure that they're teaching students about the Holocaust. We gotta make sure they teach more than just Martin Luther King when it comes to black history. Amen. I mean, teach Amen. it. Teach it. The, the kids have got to hear that when, 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 when black Americans came back from World War II and fought side by side with their white brothers and died for this country and died for the flag, when they came home, it wasn't any different than before they left. They still had incredible segregation and didn't have the same opportunities. And that just obviously broke their hearts. And so the flag then meant something different to them because the way the flag had, they, they, because the way they've been treated. All right. So we ha have got to continue to create greater equality. We've got to be able to take care of our poor. You look, God, God what, what does God want us to do? Forget about political leadership. What does God want us to do? So as we're trying to create Jewish pride, as we're trying to create, you know, when I took my team over in 2009, I took over 13 Jewish boys, young men. They left Israel better Jewish men. They left Israel having been with me better, better Jewish fathers. They bet that it's about that, obviously, about that, that experience. So we can do better. We're not perfect. Um, my job is to prepare my kids to be successful. 95% of the kids that I've coached are black. 
They've got to live in this world. They've got to be able to navigate successfully given the opportunities and some of the limitations and some of the inequalities. And, um, um, you know, when sports, we, we don't, we try not to make excuses. Adversity reveals character. They're under real adverse situations with lots of obstacles. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to navigate it? How are you going to overcome it? It's overcomable. How are you going to, how are you going to, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean that we can't continue to change to make it better, but we can't quit, but we can't give up. And we just can't just go, well, I guess I can't. No way. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the head basketball coach at Auburn. If, the, if, if that was the case, there wouldn't be a Jewish basketball coach in the Southeastern Conference. That's for sure. Arnie, did you have something you wanted to? Well, I just, I just wanted to say, Coach, I, I, I really appreciate your wisdom and, and your passion. And, you know, you kind of you kind of led to a segue, Donna, if I could just ask uh, a, a question. I mean, you talked a little bit about um, the 2009 Maccabi experience. And, you know, one of the things I read that I, I just thought was so important and so cool is as you brought your players into Knoxville uh, for training, um, you, you brought them, you intentionally brought them to your synagogue. You wanted them to, to see you in, in that, uh, in, in that uh, area. And you know, tell us a little bit about why you did that, why, how important that aspect of Judaism was as part of the 09 Maccabi and, and then just generally about the, the Maccabi itself and how, yeah. how you enjoyed it and what your experience was. Yeah, thank you, Ernie. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, as a father, four of my children have been bar mitzvahed, and uh, they've all got strong identities. Uh, we could all practice a little bit more and uh, go to shul a little bit more. Um, but uh, I had a great foundation. I had grandparents that, uh, that wound up keeping kosher, uh, grandfather that was a plumber but still went to temple, and um, um, it was a part of who we were. It was our identity, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and I just felt the responsibility as a coach and a teacher, as a father, to bring that all together for, you know, for a group of young guys that some had a little bit of a background, some had very little background. And uh, since we were training in Knoxville, I wanted the Jewish community to be able to, uh, to see, the, see them, meet them. And, of course, we got, you know, some support, you know, from the, you know, from the Jewish community. So, uh, obviously, that was important. The Final Four in 2019 and the gold medal in 2009 were the two greatest things that I've ever accomplished uh, on the basketball court. And uh, I, I – uh, to be able to wear – the United States of America to have USA on my chest and to compete in Israel against Jews from other nations was the, uh, the, the thrill of a lifetime. And, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, obviously I'm, uh, emotional about it, but, uh, you talk about, you know, the pride in, 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 in obviously doing that. And, and the experience was, was just amazing. And I'm so glad Maccabi USA does what it does because uh, it's changing the world. And, it's, and uh, you know, one of the great stories of Passover is the fact that it's passed down from year after year. It's telling the story. That's why, it's, that's why we've lasted. That's one of the reasons why, why we are still here because we tell the story of our freedom. We tell the story of our struggle and we're taught by Torah to teach it to our children. And so for me, the idea to teach these young men and join, and, and, you know, that whole story, ah, it was fabulous. It was, it was, it was great. I guess you liked it coach, huh? Well, yeah. yeah. And, and I'll tell you a, a real funny story. We beat Israel in the championship game and I'm really yeah. glad that Israel doesn't lose at home. I mean, I pray to God every night that Israel, they're hard to beat at home, thank God. And here's the deal, we're playing in the game and, 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 and referee is not very good because the referee is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we're getting screwed against Israel. But you know, that's okay, we still came back and, and, uh, and beat them in overtime. 
Wow. All right, so we have some, we have a bunch of different questions. There's one I'm going to wait to the end, but I'm going to pop in them with this one, Arnie. Um, it's about basketball. Okay. Somebody, uh, here it is, basketball. All right, so what are you, what qualities, do, this is from a basketball coach, actually, and I know we have a bunch of shifties on, on um, there's a bunch of basketball people, which I love. Um, what qualities do you look for in recruits beyond skill? What's up, Shifty? I know Coach Slater's on this too as well, my buddy Richie. Um, you know, I, I love dimensions. And so what I tell, I tell people and I tell students, what are you good at? You know, like, what are you good at on the court? You can't be great at anything unless you're already good at it. So what are you good at? We spend so much time working on stuff we're not very good at. We've become just okay at it. When if you took the same amount of time that you worked on something you were just okay at it and you worked on what you were good at, you could become great at it. Now you got a dimension. And then my job as a coach is to put the different dimensions together. I don't need five great shooters, but a couple would help. I need five great ball handlers, but one would be really good. And so my point is, is, is kind of, you know, dimensions. I think the second thing I look at is, is winning. What, what do you do to impact winning um, as it relates to who you can guard, uh, as it relates to, you know, some of your efficiencies, as it relates to whether or not you want to be coached? Um, you know, my job is to get them from here to there, so they're not always, you know, they're not always going to be perfect. Um, I guess the, la the last thing I look for is um, I want to, when I go into school, I want to know how the janitor or the, or the lunchroom lady feels about a particular player. And, um, and, and sometimes, you know what, that star in a school, you know, he, he's able to touch other people in different ways. And when he does that, boy, that makes me want him even more. And so, you know, I don't always want to talk to the principal or the head coach. I want to talk to somebody that that, that, uh, that young man would have had to go out of his way to know. And if they know him because he went out of his way and understood the power that he had, uh, for just being nice to somebody, that's the guy I want to coach. That's great. Hey, first, let's let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about basketball and 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 some of your teams. Um, first of all, I, everybody should know you know a little bit of your background. You you, you know you you worked in the Big Ten. You you were assistant coach out in the in the the Pac-12, um, and then you went to Milwaukee uh, and and had a great run there and. You, you went and won a, a, a national championship. I'm not sure people know that, uh, at Division II at Southern Indiana. Um, we'll talk about the Final Four, but just talk about that year. I mean, you were National Coach of the Year at the Division II. It had to be an incredible uh, experience. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know it, it, again, um, you can't worry about, you know, whether I'm a Division II or whether you're a high school coach. You do the best you can with where you're at. And, um, and I, you know, I, so it was a, it was a great experience. Um, and, uh, but, but I, I think um, everybody's always worried about like the next job or the next opportunity. And when they are someplace they're they're thinking about, you know, what, what, what's next. And I think you look, you, you, I approached that division two job, like it's the last job I'd ever have. Like it was the most important job I'd ever had. Like my players all said, boy, he really cares about us. Or he really cares about winning or really cares about, you know, and so you got to jump in with both feet to wherever you're at. And if you're just a high school coach, well, then be the best. You're not just a high school coach. <laughs> you're impacting kids, and you're making a difference in people's lives. So, therefore, be the best you can. And, and don't worry about what's down the road. I never – I was proud of being a Division II coach. I stayed there for nine years. And I could have stayed there for my entire career, and my ego would have been okay. Because guess what? I was having, I was having as much an impact – on kids there as I did, you know, kids at later on. Now, when I went from Southern Indiana to Milwaukee, then to Tennessee, that's when I got a chance to coach the USA team for Maccabi USA. So in other words, I did have to progress in my profession for the leadership, even in Maccabi USA to take notice of a Jewish basketball coach and get an opportunity to coach the team. And so, you know, sometimes to the victor go the spoils, but that was one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that, that I always give some of the leadership a hard time about. So you didn't want me when I was a Division II coach. I was still pretty good back then. You only wanted me when I was a coach at Tennessee. 
Oh, coach, let's talk about you. Let's talk about you being the coach at Tennessee. You were pretty successful there, but you were by no means the most successful Tennessee coach while you were there. No, no, no. I mean, listen, let's face it, you paled in comparison. Yep. Right? Yes. Because you had the opportunity to be in the same gym and work side by side by one of the greatest basketball coaches in history, which is Pat Summit. Yep. Um, yep. Would love to get your perspective on Pat. I, I, sure. I was fortunate to know her. I loved her. I thought she was amazing, you know, uh, in all the most important ways. Her, she has a legacy of hundreds of players who adore her. Her end was uh, obviously came way too soon and unexpected, but I'm curious as to your experiences with her. Yeah, well, Pat, uh, Pat's a great friend, uh, but she was a great friend to a lot of people that she worked with. She had the ability to reach out and touch people and make you feel special regardless of your, you know, your position. Uh, Pat, did, Pat did something that was very difficult to do. She created a brand. Yes. It was called the Lady Vols. They were like the Dallas Cowboys or the New York Yankees or whatever brand there was for a, a little bit of a dynasty for however, ever how it, or the Boston Celtics. I know that's difficult for some of my New York people from New York that are on the call listening to. But when Pat coached Candace Parker, and they were in really difficult, challenging times, and Candace wanted to throw a hissy fit. Mm -hmm. um, Pat would be able to look at her and with them steely blue eyes and say, look, girl, you signed up for this. You said you wanted to be coached. You said you wanted to be pushed. You said we, you wanted to be a lady of all. And, and what did that mean? It meant, you know, doing all the things that you needed to do to be a great teammate, to be a champion, to be a winner, all the sacrifices that were required. And so her honesty, um, her, the way she held everybody to account, the, where, where she set the bar. It was national champion or bust. It was be the best you could be or bust. And um, she was a great friend and a great mother. Um, but more than anything else, she was just a great person. And so I would tell sometimes different recruits, look, there are other great coaches, other really good X's and O coaches. Pat was as good as any of them, but that wasn't what separated her. She was an amazing woman. She was an amazing leader. She was an amazing wife and mother and friend. And if you want to be good at that, you need to come play for her. The basketball will take care of itself. And it always did because she had great champions. The other thing that Pat did, you know, you remember Mickey DeMoss. I do. And you remember, you remember her, Pat was willing to empower her assistants. She was never in a situation where she knew it all, all the time. And she was a strong enough leader to empower others around her to make it be either their idea or where they could be great. A lot of times people that do great things build people around them to help them do great things. And that's not the way to get things done. The way to get things done is to empower people so that when, when we do great things, great things happen for them also. And that's, that's what Pat did. Awesome. That's really great. Let's, uh, so let's move it one more career step. Let's talk about Auburn, Alabama. Uh, so coach, a couple things. I'm, I'm familiar with Alabama. Um, number one, because my mom, who I, I think may be on this Zoom tonight, but she's from that school a little bit to the, to the Northwest in Tuscaloosa. I understand. I know, but we won't talk about that tonight. We won't talk about the Tigers tonight. <laughs> but, but, but first of all, actually, I do want to ask you as part of the question, um, obviously, you, you're, you went from one SEC school to another. You understand the intensity of rivalries down there. But had you ever, ever seen a rivalry like Alabama-Auburn? And then I do want to talk to you about the Final Four. Um, sure. I mean, obviously, one of the greatest runs in school history. Um, I will tell you, all of the people on the Zoom tonight, we were all cheering for you. We, we thought that call was the worst call in basketball. But you know what? You handled the post game with such class in a moment where, you know, everybody, I'm sure, was devastated. Just kind of talk about those two topics. Well, the first thing with Auburn, Alabama, Alabama was smart enough back in the day to, to, to figure out that there were Jewish students that wanted to go some other places around the country. And so they had a great Hillel and they built a great Jewish student organization and it still lives to this day. 
Uh, and so those a lot of the Jewish people in the state of Alabama, they all went to Alabama. That's what none of them went to Auburn. And so now they're really conflicted. Because like I said, blood's thicker than water. You got a Jewish basketball coach at Auburn, you know, versus your love for your school. I don't know. I've converted I've converted a lot of them to still love Auburn basketball because because we because they got a Jewish basketball coach. Um, the rivalry's intense. It just means more in the SEC. We have no pro sports in most of our states. And so as a result, you know, we are the best conference in the country when it comes to football, basketball, baseball, golf, tennis, swimming, soccer, men, women. It's really, it's really great. And if you can be in the best in our league, you know, you could be, you know, the best in the country. Um, and um, anyway, so I do, I do love Auburn for, you know, for, I uh, love the community. Uh, it is. It is a Christian community. And one of the ways that I try to bring Christians and Jews together is through Jesus. And I tell them, I said, look, you know your God, you know Jesus? He was a rabbi. He was a rabbi. And, and uh, he was a great teacher. And so guess what? Your guy and my guy, they were the, they were the same guy. You know, <laughs> again, my wife's two favorite Jews are me and Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And so that stuff brings us together. Um, and, 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 uh, all right, enough on all right, that. Hold on, hold on. What about, do you run into Barkley at all? Does Barkley come back? Oh yeah, Barkley's the best. We built a statue for him. Uh, he's the real deal. Yes, uh, he is. Listen, I don't know anybody that is more accomplished that takes his time for anybody and everybody like Charles does genuinely. Um, he's a really good man. He really cares. Uh, certainly loves Auburn and appreciates the fact that he would never have made it out of Leeds, Alabama. Right. If it wasn't for Sonny Smith and Auburn being patient with him and putting up with him and pushing him enough to get him at least in a position where he could go, you know, be great. And he was a great pro and a great Olympian. And obviously what he's doing right now, he's probably be as good as anybody you know, Arnie, with the exception of maybe you, uh, Charles is next as far as one of the all-time great uh, uh, yes, broadcasters. Yes. Uh, thank you, Coach. You made my you made my year. Come on. Oh my God, Arnie, Arnie, you, I'm telling you, you just went way up there. All right, let's let Coach. Here's a couple of comments for you. I think I want to share in front of everyone here. Coach sure. Pearl, thank you for your time, for your message of hope, support, and inclusion. Chazak, Chazak, from Eric, the athletic director of Yeshiva of Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York. There you go. There you go. Um, oh, this is from Kenny. On a lighter note, does Coach have a deal with the dry cleaner at Auburn? He is a Final Four Spitzer. <laughs> no, I don't. I have to just say, this one, I don't know who this person is, but I, I, Gustavo, I know he's on the phone, Gustavo Souza. He says, hey, Coach, I am an incoming international student for the fall 2020. I'm excited to be joining the War Eagle family. I was wondering, when do you think you're going to be able to hold tryouts for the team? Hope to meet you in person as soon as possible and enjoy it. And he's from Brazil. And I got to tell you, I don't know who he is, but this is an amazing thing he just did. Yeah, so stop awesome. on me, Coach Pearl. Nice to meet you, brother. And uh, we'll have tryouts uh, uh, in, uh, in September. And uh, I do have, uh, 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 I have a, a very special place in my heart for guys that walk on, non-scholarship players. We only have 13 guys on scholarship. We have 18 guys on a team. And so five guys are, you know, paying their own way. My son, Steven, who played on that 2009 uh, gold medal Maccabi team, uh, he was on my team. He played for me at Tennessee as a walk-on. And Lior Berman from Birmingham, Alabama. Lior is a sophomore at Auburn, and he uh, uh, is not on scholarship for athletics, but he's a 4.0 student. He's a, he's a 4.0 student athlete. Um, he's got a chance to play for us someday at Auburn, and he will be representing hopefully USA uh, in 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 uh, in, the, in the next Maccabi in uh, in Israel. So I'm working really hard with Leor to get him right and ready. If you don't know who he is, you're you're gonna know who he is. There you go. Well, there you go, Leor. What's up, man? How you doing? Hey, Leor, we got a call in about uh, 11 minutes to uh, yeah, sure. you know to with, I've, I've got a Zoom call with my team right afterwards. So you're gonna have to you and I are gonna have to hang up and go on the next one. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hey, Coach, we got a great, we got a great question from the yep. chat from, from a preteen who wants your advice on balancing um, sports, has a love for sports, 
but also has a great love for Judaism and Hebrew school and all of the conflicts that sometimes preteens and teenagers face. Any, what, any, any advice you could give? Well, I just think, I think it's great that, uh, that after school, uh, is it he or she, he is going to Hebrew school, which is, which is fabulous, and uh, going to Sunday school and taking, uh, and taking that time. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I will say this about, about those Hebrew studies. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest ways you can hurt someone's feelings is to ignore them. Think about that. We can, we can kibitz with each other. We can give each other a hard time. We could be mad at each other. We could be this, that. But when somebody's ignoring you, that you wish would have paid you a little bit of attention, that hurts your feelings. And so for me, I encourage my student athletes, or I would encourage this young student, don't hurt God's feelings. Go to Hebrew school, spend some time. He loves you and he wants to get to know you. And by going to Hebrew school, you'll have a better way and a better understanding on how to love him. And so that's how I look at that. And then, you know, and like anything, you know, whatever you're doing, do it, do it to the best of your ability. You know, be, be, be as good a son as you can be. Be as good a student at Hebrew as you can be. Be as good a, a, a player as you can be. You know, you, you know, you can't be great at everything, but you know what? What you're doing, take time and do it to the best of your ability. Coach, how, how, uh, how special was it to have – I mean, you're obviously a very close family person. How, how special was it to have your son not only play – uh, at Tennessee, but also be with you now in the coaching ranks. Well, it's very, it was, it's been very special. Um, Arnie, Donna, uh, you know, uh, Dan, you guys, Steve, you guys are all on the call. Um, anybody, every on the call, think about your life's greatest moments, just whatever they are for you personally. Think about whatever they were. It could be the birth of a child, right? Some, some birth of a grandchild, something a championship, a gold medal. The reason, one of the reasons why that was so special to you was because you shared it with your family, because you shared it with the people that you love. And that's why it was the most special moment. So to win a gold medal or to get to the final four or to win an SEC championship or, you know, whatever it is, it, it just made it more special. So Stephen played, all right? My wife, Brandy, videotaped. My daughter, Jackie, was the manager. And so the whole family went over there. And you know how we try to do things. We try to cut costs. It's not like I can bring a, 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 a big staff to Israel to go over there. And, you know, so we, 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 it, was, it, was, it was all accomplished by the family. And we all shared that together. In fact, I'm going to show you this picture right here. If you guys can see that right there, that's in my office. And that was right after we beat uh, – we beat Israel in the uh, in the gold in the gold medal game. That's, That's awesome. Great. That's great, Coach. Hey, Coach, we have a special guest that was in the chat that you and I know, and I just want to make sure we recognize her, Alexandra Cohn Yay! from Milwaukee, the best basketball player that Northwestern's seen in a long time, <laughs> and an Israeli player. And I know you are very fond of the family. In fact, that's where we met. Oh man, yeah, Alexi, what's up, girl? Are you in Israel or are you in Milwaukee? I'm in Milwaukee, heading back in September, hopefully. Oh, man, that is – that is. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know I loved your dad and, and still love your mom, and, and you, give, you, you give, give everybody hugs and kisses. Will do. And where, uh, where's David Seisler? He works in college basketball at ESPN and said he wanted to add something of what he's – Coach, seen. how are you? David, are what's up, man? Uh, you know, I have the pleasure of managing uh, basketball at ESPN. I know Bruce, and I just have to tell everybody on the phone, we brought game day, and uh, we, when Bruce played Kentucky on a Saturday, and, and I got down for that, what he has built at Auburn, uh, that was the best game day show all year, uh, the crowd, the game. Seth Greenberg came down, former coach, Maccabi. Dan Schulman, play-by-play. Uh, former player, Canada Maccabi. So I think we were all well represented. Uh, and the only thing, Coach, I'm going to add is I think to, to get Judaism back in college basketball, you, Buzz Williams, and Sean Miller, instead of 
when we talk about how much you're sweating, I think we should say how much you're spitzing on the sidelines. I, <laughs> I think that'll help us all a little bit. Well, David, good, to, great to see you, man. And uh, yeah, David is like he's he's in charge of college basketball at ESPN. I'm not trying to blow you up there, but getting college game day uh, to Auburn, that's the that's the sort of the work of a lifetime. You work your whole life to to have something like that happen. And for our fans and for our people, it was the ultimate crown of uh, legitimacy. Like, oh my gosh, we we are a real basketball program. If Jay Billis is coming to our campus and and bringing college game day, you right. know, with him. And, and Dave, I'm going I'm to mention this because this is an idea. This is something that I'm going to do. Um, you know, you know, in, in, in August, you know, these, um, these former players are all playing. They were playing in these, these games in the, in the summertime. For, and, and they were starting to get on TV. And we started watching Syracuse alums. And you, you know what I'm talking about? And the, I don't TB, know how- TB, the TBT. It's coming back this year. All right. Okay. So what I want to do. Because I've been going, I've gone to Israel a couple times, and I'm going to, I'm doing this. Is you know, you know, how, um, college teams can take a foreign trip every four years. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I've been over, I've been all over the world with my college teams, and and, but Israel's never been a destination for the college teams because of either safety and security or things like that. We went to different places. Where where else do they love basketball more than Israel? They have they have great venues. And so what I'd like to do, and it's along the lines of Maccabi USA, or it's along the lines of birthright in this sense. If you can imagine we bring four college basketball teams to Israel and play in some different cities, 90% of those teams are made up of African-American men. They see Israel in a different way. They experience her in a different way. Now they come back to this country. Look, it's a great place for them to go back and be a pro. It might be a great place for them to to do business, but more than anything, the exposure to our Jewish homeland, mm-hmm. I think is going to go a long way to, to this. And so I'm, I'm going to take my team over there. And I bet you, I bet you as we're looking for programming, if we do it right, we can partner with some people over there and maybe get something on the SEC network or something to make it, uh, I love make it. it really special. Do you like that idea? I, I love it. And, uh, I know you like to take your teams nice places. I was with you in Maui also. <laughs> I just want to say everybody here on this call just witnessed deal making at its finest. <laughs> Coach just made his pitch to ESPN. It's usually I think ESPN it's accepted. And so therefore we are all gonna watch you in Israel, right? Is that the it's deal? Usually- Don, it's usually back channels the way Bruce operates. There were some other I, I mediators. He came directly at me this time. I'm sure jo- uh, John Oren, who's one of the other guys from SBJ, has already picked this up, David. It's already yeah. out there, and it's, and it's a done deal. It's the way to get things done. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, Joy, I know you have a question, but, like, our time is up. Joy is our ambassador, mine and Arnie's official ambassador for the show. She wanted to know if you'd have any problem. I don't th- I think – I don't think I, – I just don't think coaches any problems, Joy, about a lack of live audiences for teams playing at the college level. I mean, with the coronavirus, when we if we move yeah, there's forward, still a, there's still the coronavirus around. I think we're people are starting to forget that, especially in the southeast, coach. Yeah. No. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna do what's safe. Um, as you guys know, things are changing on a, on a regular basis. We've just got to be prepared to make uh, whatever adjustments. You know, after 9-11, we went through airports differently. We 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 had a lot of no, things. She wants to know whether you you care about not playing in front of a crowd. Um. Look, I'd rather play in front of a crowd, but I would. I want to also do what's 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 safe, and what's healthy. And um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Look, we know that we know who is at risk, um, and uh, and 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 obviously, you know, my my parents, your pe- people that are at risk have got to be much more careful as it relates to being out there in the public. And um, as we continue to learn more and more about about the survival uh, and battling this virus will determine what's safe in our stadiums. Um, but it, it would be my hope that if it is safe, we're going to be able to get the crowds uh, back into the games. Okay. Well, first so, I, yeah, Arnie, but, Arnie, have any closing? Yeah, I did. I did. Well, I just gonna, I'm just going to kind of close it out and then turn it back over to you, Donna. Um, sure. Coach, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your, your time. We were so excited when you agreed to do this because 
lots of people within Makami family, you know, really appreciated 09 and, and you being there, you know, with us. And uh, obviously you have huge fans out there with that Jewish community and, and non-Jewish community. We're, we're greatly appreciative. I want to wish you nothing but the best. Stay healthy and, and safe. And uh, I hope to look, look forward to a basketball season this year. And uh, we'll see you when you come to Baton Rouge. I'll, I'll catch you in, uh, at, uh, with LSU. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to you know, staying in touch with you. God bless you all. And thank you all for the work that you do for Maccabi USA. Oh, thanks so much. And the, your stories just help validate all, all the work that everyone does. So I want to say, listen, welcome everybody uh, again and good night. And before yes. we go, I just want to say, Bruce, you're a diamond. Uh, amazing. Just really appreciate you. I want to thank thanks you. to the MSU, MUSA, of course, where their t uh, team, where teamwork is fantastic. So Danny, Mackenzie, Steve, Shane. I didn't see Marshall tonight, but we're always thankful to Marshall. Julie, welcome Danny, our new team member, and of course our president, Jeff Buchan. So I, I, you know, it's always great to see you, Jeff. Next week, you're not going to believe this, we'll be talking sports again, Arnie. Not next week, in two, two weeks. weeks. Two That's weeks, funny. June 23rd, Tuesday. But you know the good part is, we'll be talking with real sportscasters. And I don't know how many of you know this. Ready? Go! <laughs> well, that's Andre Cantor, and he works for Telemundo Deportes, NBC Sports, Spanish language division. Who knew that he was Jewish? But he is known for soccer globally. He'll be joining us along with another really well-known sportscaster, Kenny Albert, the only broadcaster currently handling play-by-play -play for all four major U.S. sports: NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL. Um, and I think Kenny, you know Kenny comes from a great sportscasting family, the Alberts. Yes, Marv is his dad. And we will have one other sportscaster, which we will be announcing shortly. So we hope that you will join us, share with your friends. Um, I think that's it. Danny, Arnie? Uh, no, just stay with us all summer. We're going to, every couple weeks, um, we're going to bring on prominent uh, national Jewish sports figures. Uh, we work on it almost every day from owners in professional sports to broadcasters to other people involved in the industry. So we really appreciate everybody joining in. Thank you to everyone with Maccabi and uh, all of you. And again, like I said to Bruce, please stay healthy and safe and look forward to joining my good friend Donna in two yes. weeks. It'll be a lot of it's so much fun. David, David, tell the word back at ESPN, okay? Tell them we're here and we're just rocking it, okay? <laughs> Good night, everybody. Be well and be safe.